Hey, what is up, guys? It's Conan coming back at you with another board review question ses session. Um, <laughs> so let's just get started. Again, we're going to try and go for that uh, coveted 100% correct ratio uh, at some point if we can. We haven't been able to get it yet, but let's see if we can get it this time. So a 29-year-old woman is evaluated during a routine examination. Which of the following lifestyle modifications is most likely to reduce the patient's risk for developing rheumatoid arthritis? Alcohol cessation discontinuation of oral contraceptives, increased physical activity, smoking cessation, and weight loss. This is one that I actually don't know um, because I didn't know that like all these lifestyle modifications could potentially reduce the risk of rheumatoid arthritis. It looks like um, her mother was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. She's smoking and consumes six alcohol. Oh, I know the answer to this. Okay, so smoking. I know that smoking does, uh, you know, it's one of the worst things you can do for your health and it also is associated with worsening your risk for getting um, rheumatoid arthritis. So let's just do smoking cessation. 99% of the time, man, if if smoking cessation is on the answers, it's like, you got to do it. People need to stop smoking. It's like the worst, absolute worst thing they can do for your health. If there's any one piece of, uh, you know, lifestyle change that you can offer for your patients, that's going to have the biggest impact on their health. It's going to be smoking cessation. All right, next question. A 35-year-old woman arrives at the emergency department with epigastric abdominal pain of three months duration, which has worsened during the past week. Uh, so epigastric for three months, maybe some kind of, I, I don't know, she's getting kind of close to the age range where she could be getting gallbladder disease, biliary colic, although uh, that would be more typically right upper quadrant rather than epigastric. Uh, a triphasic CT scan of this abdomen shows occlusion of the hepatic veins, ascites, splenomegaly, and abdominal varices. Oh, shoot. Okay, this is a lot worse than I thought initially. No cirrhosis is seen. Which of the following is the most appropriate diagnostic test to perform next? Alpha fetoprotein, so that's if we think she has a hepatocellular carcinoma, which is associated with a rise in AFP. It's definitely not going to be this one because they probably would have seen something on the CT, especially with a triple phase CT. Uh, factor 8 level, so this would be if somebody had a factor 8 deficiency, kind of like we talked about in the last video, that would be a bleeding disorder, not a hypercoagulable disorder. This person clearly has some kind of clotting problem. Flow cytometry for CD55 and 59, this is talking about paroxysmal uh, nocturnal hema hematuria is what I believe. Um, and that, again, is not a clotting problem. And so here uh, they're talking about jak 2 v 617 f mutation, which is probably some kind of a central thrombocythemia thing. So uh, I'd be looking to see if her platelet count is elevated, but my eyes just darted up here and I did not see an elevated platelet count. So I'm not entirely sure yet. Um, but I think maybe it's this paroxysmal nocturnal hematuria because they may have an increased risk for clots as well. Um, so let's see. Uh, she reports fatigue. Medical history is significant for a DVT that occurred four years ago. So she's got m multiple uh, clotting events and was treated with six months of anticoagulation. She takes no medications. In this situation, uh, I actually recently did the videos on anticoagulation. And if the patient has an unprovoked DVT or venous thromboembolism or, or PE, uh, really the, the strategy at this point is typically preferring lifelong anticoagulation. And so she's got this DVT of like unknown etiology four years ago. She probably should have been continued on lifelong anticoagulation from what I've read recently. So vital signs are normal, but pulse is 105. She has mildly diffuse abdominal tenderness. The uh, physical exam is otherwise non-contributory. Aptoglobin is normal. Hemoglobin is slightly low at 11. White blood cell is slightly low. MCV is borderline low. Uh, platelets are normal. Alkafos is slightly elevated. And her direct bilirubin is elevated. And total bilirubin is elevated. So this is she's got a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And her GGT, which suggests biliary disease, is also elevated. So she's got some problem in her biliary duct. Ah, uh, hmm. Because now I'm not thinking of the paroxysmal uh, PNH, um, because that usually has like a hemolytic anemia process associated, which I believe. Um, so we would expect to see a low haptoglobin and an unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Jack 2 v 617 f Again, I'm thinking that's a central thrombocythemia, 
but her platelets are normal. I, I'm not sure if that's exactly what it is. Factor A level, again, I really don't think that plays a role here. Mm. And then alpha feta protein. I mean, she got a triphasic CT scan of the abdomen. I would have, if they had, if she had hepatocellular carcinoma, I feel like they would have seen some kind of mass. So there could be some other cause of alpha feta protein. This is a tough one for me. I, I think at this point I've ruled out C. I really don't think it's B. And I don't think it's A, so maybe it's D. At this point, I think she does have bad Chiari. All I know is that there's like pre-hepatic, intrahepatic, and post-hepatic. And uh, if there's post-hepatic occlusion of the veins, then you'll get all this congestion in your liver. It could cause uh, a hyperbilirubinemia, a conjugated uh, hyperbilirubinemia. And you get the splenomegaly, abdominal varices. And it'd be atypical for a 35-year-old woman to have like severe... Um, uh, cirrhosis at age 35. So I, I think she probably does have Bud Chiari is what I'm thinking. And uh, maybe she does have some kind of un small hepatocellular carcinoma that we were not able to detect on imaging, but that's abnormal. This is a hard one for me. I'm going to go with alpha feta protein, actually. I, I, I was really thinking about picking this Jack 2. But her platelets are normal. I'm pretty sure Jack 2 is thrombocythemia. So I, she should have high platelets and be hypercoagulable. So I think she may have some kind of underlying malignancy, which is leading to this uh, diffuse clotting everywhere. So let's see. Oh, I was Jack 2. God damn it. <laughs> Diagnose a myeloproliferative neoplasm in a patient with hepatic vein thrombosis. Darn it. No 100% today, you guys. Oh, it's not essential thrombocythemia. It's polycythemia. Oh, shoot. Oh, and also 50% of patients with essential thrombocytosis, even without the presence of erythrocytosis or thrombocytosis. Yeah, so I, I mean, I knew she had some kind of hypercoagulable thing going on, um, but because of the normal platelet count, that I think that was what threw me off. So that was actually a good, uh, a good case. And then they start talking about Bud Chiari syndrome. So yeah, I actually had that just mixed up in my mind, what, you know, the vein uh, anatomy was for the liver, but portal vein is prehepatic. So that, you know, that would not cause liver congestion, ascites, and splenomegaly. But uh, hepatic vein is post-hepatic. So it's, that's already after the liver has filtered all the blood and everything. So if you get congestion there, you get a blood clot in the hepatic veins, then you have Bud Chiari syndrome because, or you can get Bud Chiari syndrome because the liver is going to get congested. You're going to get high bilirubin. You're going to get all these downstream effects as well. So she did have Bud Chiari syndrome. Yeah, see, I really didn't think it was hepatocellular carcinoma, but because her platelets were normal, I felt like I couldn't choose the JAK2 muta mutation. Um, but uh, yeah, this is actually a good thing to know that, you know, you don't necessarily need to have uh, elevated uh, platelets or elevated hemoglobin um, to have this condition, this myeloproliferative problem. And then paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria is associated with abdominal vein thrombosis. But again, like I said, normal haptoglobin and absence of indirect hyperbilirubinemia indicate no evidence of hemolysis. All right, we spent a lot of time on that question. I, I wanted to make it a little more rapid fire. So let's just move on. I like seeing this, a big question. So hopefully there's something interesting in here. But a 25-year-old man is evaluated in the emergency department for fever, productive cough, off, dyspnea and pleuritic chest pain that began several days ago. I'm, I'm already thinking some kind of like acute pericarditis kind of thing. Fever, cough, dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain. So uh, sputum acid fast bacilli smear sm shows acid fast bacilli. Culture results are pending. Oh shoot. Okay. That took a turn. So he's got like some kind of mycoplasma possibly like t some kind of tuberculosis problem. We'll see. Which of the following is the most appropriate management? Await culture results, pause antiretroviral therapy. This guy probably has HIV then. Start prednisone or start RIPE. So um, he reports no other symptoms. IV, ceftriaxone, and oral azithromycin are initiated for presumed community-acquired pneumonia, and he is hospitalized. Medical history is significant for a recent diagnosis of HIV infection for which he began antiretroviral therapy one month ago. Other medications are lamivudine, abacavir, and dolutegravir. On physical exam, he is quite febrile with temperature of 102.6, blood pressure 136 over 84, heart rate 110, and respiratory rate 20%. He's satting 90% on room air, which is pretty pretty low for a healthy or for a 25 year old guy. Cardiac exam is normal and lungs are clear bilaterally. Lab studies at the time of HIV diagnosis showed a viral load of 95,000 copies of and CD4 count of 256. 
Interferon gamma release assay for tuberculosis was indeterminate because of inadequate response to the positive control. One week ago, viral load was 1,000 and CD4 count was 313. So he actually had um, an adequate response to the um, antiretroviral therapy. Uh, you're usually looking for um, after like six weeks or 20 something weeks, I forget, I had to look it up, but you're looking for like the viral load um, to be less than 2,000 copies or something. Uh, I'll have to look that up, but a chest radiograph shows an infiltrate in the right middle lobe and bilateral hilar enlargement. So um, he's basically got um, reactivated TB because uh, when you start treating these patients with HIV, you can cause what's called iris or immune reconstitution uh, inflammatory syndrome. And if they had, you know, TB that was sitting there before, he just wasn't really mounting much of an immune response to it because his HIV was so out of control. Uh, although his CD4 count was actually pretty good. Um, but yeah, I, I think this case is probably a TB that was there or maybe he had latent TB. And then after getting antiretroviral therapy, he's starting to have this immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome uh, or iris. And so the uh, treatment for this is really to just continue antiretroviral therapy and uh, just treat the TB. Um, I would not start prednisone. I would not pause his antiretroviral therapy and I would not await culture results. Um, I think I would just start therapy. Um, yeah, these questions are a lot more difficult than the, the last video. Well, actually, there's a couple situations where you don't want to give antiretroviral therapy. The risk of iris is very dangerous if you have cryptococcal meningitis. And I think the other one is actually TB. So in this case, you know, maybe we do give prednisone to just kind of... Because the, the ripe therapy is going to take months to kick in. He's like very sick right now. Oh, uh, maybe it is prednisone. Oh my God. Pause antiretroviral therapy. I think you still continue it even if they have iris. Unless they're really sick, you might pause it. This is actually a difficult one for me, you guys. Oh, I'm going to get multiple wrong. I'm going to go with start prednisone because I feel like it's important to keep them on the antiretroviral therapy. I don't think the ripe's going to kick in fast enough. I think we need to just like kind of help him get through this acute phase, which is, feels really wrong to me because we're giving prednisone to somebody who has like a severe infection. So this might be really, just really wrong. Um, but let's just see what happens. Oh, God. Let's start ripe. Oh, this is embarrassing, you guys. <laughs> Oh my god, what? I feel like Rife's gonna take so long. Yeah, Prentice didn't make any sense. I'm embarrassed for picking that, you guys. Ah, uh, I talked myself out of it. Ah, uh, 88% of the freaking everybody got this question right. <laughs> So antiretrovirals should not be stopped when iris occurs. Therapy should be continued while providing treatment for the newly diagnosed infection. Okay, so I got that part right. Never stop antiretroviral therapy. Prednisone can be added if iris is life-threatening or involves the pericardium or central nervous system. None of these is the case in this patient. So I knew, I knew there was some indication to giving steroids if they were sufficiently sick enough. Um, but yeah, giving steroids without a known diagnosis increases the risk of worsening an infection that is not being directly treated. So uh, I knew there was some indication for giving steroids, but uh, that, yeah, that was a difficult one. So uh, yeah, I, I, I talked myself out of it because I thought RIPE would take too long to start working, but honestly, they should probably should just keep, you know, start, start the treatment right away. Oh, and this is what I was talking about earlier. So uh, HIV treatment, uh, you want to get their viral load less than 200 copies within 24 weeks of starting antiretroviral therapy. So that is um, considered virologic failure of HIV treatment if they have viral load persistently above 200 after, what is that, six months of starting antiretroviral therapy. So he was not, he was only one month in. So, you know, he did have an adequate response, but he wasn't quite at that like less than 200 copies level yet. All right, let's do one more question. Um, let's try and save this and get at least equal number of questions right as we do wrong in this session. So question 30, wow, this is a short one. A 60-year-old woman is evaluated after screening colonoscopy, showed two polyps in the ascending colon, 
measuring 12 millimeters and 5 millimeters in size. Both polyps were removed completely. Pathology showed both polyps to be sessile serrated polyps. These are pre-malignant polyps. So there is no history of colon cancer in her family. When should this patient next undergo surveillance colonoscopy? This is a tough one. I, I think as somebody who's not a specialist, you're not going to know the exact timing. Um, but it's definitely not 10 years because she's got pre-malignant polyps. I think it's probably going to be three years. Um, you know, maybe I don't think it's one year because uh, I don't know. I think that would be that seems pretty quick. Um, you know, this is a, this one's fairly large though. It's 1.2 centimeters, but I think it's gonna be three years. Let's just go with that. Yep, 60% right. All right, that was a quick one. So let's do one more so we can end with a majority uh, of victories uh, on this session. A 38 year old woman is evaluated for intermittent palpitations. Right heart chambers are enlarged and the estimated pulmonary artery systolic pressure is normal. Which of the following is the next best management? Cardiac MRI device closure of the atrial septal defect, endocarditis prophylaxis, or measurement of functional aerobic capacity. So it seems like she's got an atrial septal defect, which may be leading to high chronic pressures in her right side of her heart, is what I'm thinking right now. So she reports no other symptoms. Medical history is unremarkable, and she takes no medications. On physical exam, vitals are normal. Estimated CVP is elevated, again, showing that she has elevated right-sided pressures. Apical impulse is normal, and a parasternal impulse impulse is present at the left sternal border and a soft systolic murmur is heard at the second left intercostal space which would be kind of like the pulmonary area fixed splitting of the s2 is noted throughout the uh, cardiac cycle um, so yeah this is actually consistent with an asd atrial septal defect and this fixed splitting whenever you see fixed splitting of s2 um, that's suggestive of an atrial septal defect the remainder of the physical exam is normal uh, she has right axis deviation. Again, that makes sense because she's got right-sided elevated heart pressures. So she's probably getting like hypertrophy of the right side of the heart. So you're getting more, um, you know, deviation of her EKG leads to the right side of the heart as well as an incomplete right bundle branch block. Chest radiograph shows right heart enlargement. TTE shows 1.5 centimeter ostium secundum atrial septal defect. So um, I think this one's pretty simple for me. I mean, cardiac MRI is evaluating for like amyloid, stuff like that. Endocarditis prophylaxis. I don't think there's actually any indication for endocarditis prophylaxis for a septal, atrial septal defect. Um, maybe there was in the past, but I don't think there's anything actively uh, for that. And measurement of aerobic capacity, like I don't really care about that. I want to just close the thing that's causing the right side of her heart to be enlarged. So let's pick that. And yep, we got 67% correct. So cardiac MRI, I guess, can also be used to evaluate an ASD, but she already had sufficient evaluation on her echo. And then endocarditis prophylaxis is recommended for patients with congenital heart disease characterized by unrepaired cyanotic disease, palliative shunts and conduits, and congenital defect during the first six months after complete repair with prosthetic material. So if there's any like prosthetic stuff, basically, or it's really bad, then you can consider endocarditis uh, prophylaxis. Uncomplicated ASD does not require endocarditis prophylaxis. Hopefully one of these days we're going to get that 100% coveted uh, correct ratio, although I feel like even if that does happen, I'm just going to keep doing questions until I eventually get one wrong. Uh, so I don't know if I'll ever actually even get that. <laughs> I'll have to like set like a set number of questions to do during these sessions. And maybe then I'll get 100% correct. But uh, so far, we have not quite achieved that. And that's good. You know, having some questions wrong every now and then is good for learning and uh, brings up some learning points for, for me to make like some flashcards on. Oh, yeah. And before I go, I just wanted to show you guys really quickly how I make these flashcards for questions that I get wrong. And this is my simple approach. I just want to make one card pretty much for any question that I got wrong. And I just want to target that one piece of information that I probably, you know, needed in order to get that question right. So for one of the questions I put, should antiretrovirals be stopped if iris occurs? And then I wrote no. You should treat the underlying infection. In the case of our uh, question, it was to start RIPE therapy and only add prednisone if life-threatening or pericardial slash CNS involvement is present. So I'll add extra details down here, but the answer that I have for my flashcard is a very direct, very simple answer. Even if it's sometimes just a yes or no answer, this is something that helps prompt me and remind me of this learning point 
uh, and reminds me of this question that I got wrong. Again, this is a very, very simple one, but can a JAK2 myeloproliferative neoplasm present without elevated hemoglobin or platelets? And the answer was yes. And that was the crux of why I got that first question wrong um, with the uh, Bud Chiari syndrome was because I didn't know that JAK2 could actually be there without high hemoglobin or platelets. So again, just try and focus on making simple, easy to uh, answer flashcards because this makes going through the flashcards a lot easier and also make sure that there's only you know one defined answer. There's not multiple different answers and you don't know if you should mark the card correct or wrong because you only got part of the answer right. There needs to be one discrete answer for each one of your flashcards. I hope you guys enjoyed watching. I'll see you guys in the next one and peace. Peace.